extraordinary events causing great loss of life, damage, or hardship, like a flood, a tornado, an airplane crash, or an earthquake. Awesome reminders of the terrible power of nature and grim lessons in mankind's capacity for destruction. In desperate hours, you'll be an eyewitness to some of the greatest disasters of the last 100 years. In this episode, we contemplate from a safe distance the lethal majesty of volcanoes, one of the planet's most destructive as well as spectacular natural forces. It is estimated there are up to 4,000 volcanoes on Earth, of which annually about 50 are active volcanoes above sea level, emitting in their eruptions millions of tons of dust, ash, and gases, and endangering the lives and property of millions of people. Montserrat, an emerald island in the Caribbean Sea, described by tourist guidebooks as late as the 1990s as a tropical paradise. The beauty of Montserrat must have enchanted voyagers already in 1493, when it was discovered by Christopher Columbus. It was the volcano that changed the tropical paradise into hell on Earth. Although geologists believed that the Sufria Hills volcano was inactive. On 18 July 1995, after four quiet centuries, this sleeping giant suddenly awoke. The subsequent huge eruption spewed out large volumes of pyroclastic material over a radius of 15 kilometers. The following apocalypse especially hit the capital city of Plymouth, which will never forget this day. Plymouth was buried in several meters of mud and ash. The day changed into night. The quiet atmosphere of a town carelessly bathing in the sun just a while beforehand suddenly changed into the worst nightmare. Look up, and what I saw, I left the cabin running. I ran away from the mountain coming down. The point on which I decide to leave the island is after I've been, been over in the hills and see the last Paraclastic flow that make me move. Two thirds of the population had to be evacuated, hastily leaving their homes, which most of them never returned to. I was living in the buffer zone, right? The, um, the zone which they would move next if activity from the volcano increases and right now they have evacuated that zone. Pero ahora yo no sé qué van a hacer ahora porque evacuaron desde yo vivía, mi mamá vivía en el parte en el norte donde no evacuaron todavía. Because of the volcano, the number of Montserrat inhabitants fell from 12,000 to 4,500 people. However, none of the people who refused to leave their beloved Caribbean island knew that the fury of the volcano was not over. Almost two years later, on 15 June 1997, a new explosion shook the volcano with a subsequent outburst of magma. Flows of lava literally ate into the hill on its way. And again, a massive mud flow covered the capital Plymouth and surrounding villages. 
frightened people watched as lava flowing down the volcano slopes flattened villages and burned houses. On that day, Sufria Hills claimed 19 lives, burning them alive in hot lava. At the time of the disaster, the victims were in the forbidden area where they had fields and homes which they refused to leave. They took the risk and were unlucky, which cost them their lives. Further eruptions reinforced the flows of hot lava, which gradually buried the lively town of Plymouth on the shore. The formerly vibrant and easygoing town now witnessed apocalyptic scenes of destroyed streets covered in endless gray. Although volcanic eruptions still occasionally occur, the inhabitants of the island hope that the worst is over. Iceland is known as the land of ice and fire. The icy white landscape evokes a sense of purity and innocence. As if from time to time, it had to be stained with ash coming from volcanic eruptions. In the territory of Iceland, there are 30 active volcanic systems. Iceland is located at the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where two different tectonic plates meet. This contributes to the very intense volcanic and seismic activity in Iceland, which is not to be found anywhere else on Earth. The eruption of 1973, which took place on Hime Island, is believed to be one of the world's worst natural disasters of the 20th century. On 21 January 1973, around 8 p.m., the island was shaken by several small, almost imperceptible shocks. Despite this, nobody expected a catastrophe, the extent of which was to come. Does this volcano come as a complete surprise to you, or did you have any warning? There was no warning whatsoever until 10 o'clock yesterday evening. Uh, which the was the earthquake? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how much danger do you think this uh, eruption represents to the country, the island and its livelihood? It's quite difficult to say. It uh, depends on the volume of lava produced and on wind direction. So there's a possibility that it won't be very dangerous? It's quite, yes, I, I think so, actually. At 2 a.m. on 23 January 1973, a new crack appeared in the eastern side of the volcano Eldfell, whose name means Mountain of Fire in Icelandic. It was less than a kilometer away from the center of Hime City, whose citizens were caught absolutely unprepared. Red-hot lava started to flow from the crack at appalling speed. Volcanic dust fell on the roofs of houses. 
The frightened citizens of the island were woken by police sirens and evacuated to safety off the island. They were lucky. They were all successfully evacuated in time. As there had been a strong storm around the island the previous day, most of the fishing boats had stayed in the harbor. They were used to save lives. Older and helpless people were transported by air, others on the boats. They watched as streams of lava flowed through the streets of their town destroying their houses and property, ruining their lives. The catastrophe changed the lives of all 5,000 inhabitants of the island forever. Many have never returned for fear of further eruptions, and others have had to start life again from scratch. Recently, we were again reminded of the power and presence of Icelandic volcanoes. The volcanic eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in 2010 resulted in a vast volcanic ash cloud, which blocked air travel throughout Europe. Today, most of the UK remains covered by the ash cloud. Eruption uh, it may stop tomorrow, but it may continue to disrupt air traffic for weeks or months. We don't know anything. We don't know how to get home. We don't know how to get any information uh, about what to do. And we don't have anywhere to stay. The explosive activity might drop down for a period of time, but then we will have uh, over a, maybe an extensive period of time, months to even years, uh, intermittent explosive eruptions. Iberia put us up for a few nights and gave us food put us on today's flight, today's flight's cancelled, and now they say they're not going to give us any more accommodation or any food. It was not a strong eruption, but according to seismologists, another eruption of similar scope is just a matter of time. Volcanic eruptions have always fascinated and terrified people. These natural giant fireworks emit streams of bubbling, boiling lava, traveling at speeds of up to 165 meters per second. As the lava spreads out in a breathtaking show, it can cause destruction, death, and doom. This flaming, bubbling hell turns into vast streams a lethal mixture of volcanic ash, solid lava, mud, and water, which sweeps down the mountain slopes like an unstoppable river. How and where are volcanoes born? They begin life at a depth of between 80 to 220 kilometers below the Earth's surface, in a place known as the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is actually a viscous mantle of the Earth, which allows for the movement of the Earth's lithospheric plates. Without the asthenosphere, the plates would not be able to move, and the renewal of the Earth's crust would not be possible. Where the plates touch each other, slide past one another, move under or over one another. This is where the Earth's crust is so broken that magma can find its way up to the surface. This is how a volcanic crater develops.
Indonesia has been seen as symbolic of volcanic disasters ever since the eruption of the legendary Krakatoa volcano in 1883. This land, like Iceland, is referred to as the land of volcanoes and lies in the Sunda Strait, where there is frequent Strombolian activity. Every now and then, some of them erupt, causing a local disaster. The same applies to Merapi Volcano, literally meaning Fire Mountain in the local language, is arguably Indonesia's most dangerous volcano with a history of deadly eruptions. The volcano is frequently active with eruptive episodes occurring every few years, posing a threat to more than one million people living on the slopes of the volcano. This type of activity has occurred frequently in past years, usually lasting for a few weeks or months each time. On 26 October 2010, Merapi violently erupted, spewing flows of hot rock and gas kilometers away from the summit and devastating the surrounding area. The huge explosion caused a collapse of its lava dome and red hot clouds of ash rolled down the slopes of the mountains, burning everything that stood in their way. They devastated tens of villages and all the fertile fields on the slopes. Further explosions continued daily for approximately two weeks before activity started to decrease in the middle of November. Like in 94, it was the dome collapse and the seismicity and also in the deformation, there was no signal. At the peak of activity on November 5, pyroclastic flows traveled 16 kilometers from the summit, destroying everything in their path. During the 2010 eruptive episode, more than 300 people were killed, making this most recent eruption the greatest volcanic disaster at Merapi in 80 years. Over 300,000 people were evacuated from their homes within a 20 kilometer radius of the volcano and moved to temporary shelters in safer areas away from the fiery reaches of the volcano. Saya ke sini karena kena abu dari merapi itu. Lantas saya menjadi sesak nafas dan pusing. Ya dari apa? Lampang gunung merapi ini ada debu. Terus ya ada riwayat tekanan darah tinggi juga ya. Pengembalian psikisnya yang sekali menjaga. Takutnya ada yang trauma, yang ngedrop. Target kita di sini anak-anak sama manula. Thanks to the detailed geological monitoring and timely warnings by the Indonesian Center of Volcanology and the resulting rapid evacuations, it is estimated that 10 to 20,000 lives were saved. All time that Merapi keeps two different, two different uh, activity. One eruption, explosion, and one storm collapse. Both are dangerous. So what does the future hold for Merapi and the people living on its hazardous slopes?
scientists face a challenge to unravel the driving forces behind Merapi's activity. Past eruptions hold the key to future eruptive styles, so unlocking the secrets of what lies behind Merapi's activity will help volcanologists to prevent further catastrophes occurring. The devastating explosions accompanying volcanic eruptions can completely destroy prosperous ecosystems and whole civilizations. One such volcano is Mount Nyirangongo, elevation 3,470 meters in war-torn Congo, whose last eruption occurred in January 2002. In that eruption, Lava appeared on the surface directly at the edge of Goma City in Minigi, where it started to flow out of the earth and cut the city in two. Many people had no place to flee and suffocated. Lava streams got as far as Lake Kivu, The number of victims reached about a hundred. Thousands of people lost their homes. Everything, they've lost everything, even for those houses of which they're still standing, but they've, they've lost the roof, the rooftops, and they've lost their, they've lost their belongings. Yes, they've lost everything. My house is still down. Now I don't know what I can do. Now I don't know why my family was going. Now I try to see some way if I can find to him. Niragongo is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. It is unique for its lava crater lake and highly liquid lava which you cannot escape from. Experts warn that if Niragongo shows its true power, Goma City, with its one million inhabitants, will become a contemporary Pompeii. Another threat with potentially inconceivable consequences is Yellowstone National Park in the USA. The national park is located on a supervolcano. Yellowstone is the supervolcano's caldera, under which there is the largest magma chamber in the world. It's never possible to predict a volcano, to say the volcano will erupt in three years or in 25 years. We cannot tell the future. We can only monitor the present. Queste aree eh, possono dare origine come massime eruzioni alle uniche eruzioni che possono avere effetti catastrofici globali, al pari di grandi impatti meteoritici. According to scientists, the likelihood of the supervolcano erupting is five to ten times higher than the likelihood of Earth being hit by an asteroid. We can only hope that neither we nor our descendants will experience the eruption of the supervolcano, which would bring death to hundreds of thousands of people and horrible consequences to cope with for millions of people, not only in America, but worldwide. These are volcanoes, time bombs, where it is actually just a question of time before an eruption of devastating extent will occur. And what's more, we know well that man cannot fight against nature, but must learn to live with it.
floods and famine, tornadoes and war, an airplane crash or an earthquake, natural disasters and man-made catastrophes, events that can cause enormous loss of life, destruction and hardship. In desperate hours, you'll become an eyewitness to some of the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. The Earth really moves in this episode as we look at one of the most devastating of all natural cataclysms, the earthquake in all its destructive power. Of all the natural disasters we'll look at in this episode, none release more sheer destructive energy than an earthquake. After all, it takes a great deal of the Earth's energy for two of its magnetic plates to grind against each other long enough that they go snap and jolt the planet's outer crust for hundreds of square miles. with great sadness, the great horror and heart-rending aftermath of the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal. The April 2015 Nepal earthquake, also known as the Gorkha earthquake, was responsible for over 8,000 deaths, with injuries many times over that. suffocating inside. I couldn't breathe. People die inside the, I mean the dead body inside the house. It's a nightmare. Yet even in the midst of such widespread tragedy, there are beacons of hope. A teenage boy is rescued from the rubble. It's what we call an entombment. So he wasn't specifically crushed, but what he was was inside of a box, a box with, with heavy concrete all around him. So the, the US, USAID teams, uh, what we did is we worked side by side with the local teams, and we were there to assist them uh, in getting this victim out. Across vast swathes of Nepal, entire villages were flattened, rendering hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Centuries-old buildings were obliterated at UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the Kathmandu Valley. The April 2015 earthquake also triggered an avalanche on Mount Everest, killing at least 19 and making for the deadliest day on the mountain in recorded history. We saw huge pieces of rock and ice coming down from phases of Makalu right over there over Camp 2. Well, I'm pretty well fucked. Uh, I fell through that hole. Thankfully, I didn't keep falling that way. I got trapped here instead. For this ledge, my arm I can't use. Sign of distraction. People, people going through the rumbles, trying to figure it out if there's anything left. The initial earthquake's magnitude was registered at 7.8. It was followed by continuous aftershocks within 15 to 20 minute intervals. Aftershocks can occur from days to weeks to, to months and sometimes even years after the main shock. So, I mean, it's, it's within the time period for sure to expect aftershocks like this. The capital city of Kathmandu, situated on a block of crust around 120 kilometers wide and 60 kilometers long, reportedly shifted three meters to the south in under 30 seconds. Thanks to this breathtaking footage, we can eyewitness this terrible tragedy.
Then, two weeks after the devastating quake in which more than 8,000 people were killed, Nepal was hit by another major earthquake, this one with a magnitude of 7.3. This time, over 100 people were killed and thousands injured. There was widespread damage to buildings and property in much of the shell-shocked nation. Earthquakes have always been with us, but it is really only in the last 50 years or so that their devastating impact has been captured so vividly, not only in photographs, but in moving images broadcast around the world, at first via television, and in the last 20 years or so, over the internet. Sichuan, the second largest of the Chinese provinces. It is located in the upper Yangtze River Valley in the southwestern part of the country. The Sichuan Province earthquake of May 2008. It occurred on a weekday in the middle of the afternoon. School and university classes were in full swing. Office workers had returned to their desks after lunch. 80 kilometers from the 7.6 million person megacity of Chengdu, a fault line began to rupture. resulting 7.9 magnitude earthquake in western China's mountainous Sichuan province would kill well over 8,000 people. Suddenly the ground just shaped, there was this awful noise and at first we thought maybe somewhere there was a landslide or something we never imagined it was an earthquake but it just wouldn't stop and it got louder and louder and the rocks were just being thrown down the mountains at us <laughs> About 4,800,000 people were left homeless, and the scale of damage to property was estimated to be over $80 billion. When a disaster occurs on this sort of scale, it is hard to single out any one statistic as especially grim. Because the earthquake occurred in shallow, that means about 10 kilometers uh, beneath the ground. Uh, so the damage is usually uh, very strong, uh, devastating. In the 2008 Sichuan province earthquake, an estimated 10,000 children were trapped under rubble when school buildings collapsed. many would die there. Unsurprisingly, there was a public outcry. A subsequent government investigation concluded that one in five primary schools may have been shoddily constructed and unsafe. For months after the quake, more than 20,000 students had to do with makeshift schools and classrooms, but reconstruction efforts went ahead with impressive speed. But no amount of reconstruction 
could erase the memories of those desperate hours in May 2008. But what causes earthquakes? When people talk about a seismic shift, what are they actually talking about? At the very bottom of the oceans lie the uppermost layers of the surface of our planet. The Earth's outer layer is known as the crust. The crust covers the Earth's surface a bit like a cracked eggshell. The various pieces that make up the crust are called geological or tectonic plates. The tectonic plates fit together a bit like a jigsaw puzzle with some rough edges known more scientifically as fault lines. The tectonic plates move continuously against one another. Most of the time they glide and slide along quite smoothly. Otherwise, there would be even more earthquakes. But every now and then, the tectonic plates catch and the pressure gradually but steadily builds up. Finally, the pressure becomes too much and the huge masses of rock which form the plates abruptly shift along the fault lines. This creates phenomenal waves of energy, spreading out in concentric circles, rather like waves in a pond if you throw a stone into the water. Recently, especially the Japanese scientists, uh, considering their past experience in earthquake prediction, they gave up uh, to make investment on earthquake prediction and that's why they concentrated on studies related to understand the physics of earthquakes. Most earthquakes take place within the so-called ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean. At least once a year, Alaska experiences a 7.0 earthquake. California alone gets about 10,000 quakes a year, but most go unnoticed except by seismographs. Researchers at UC Berkeley are testing a prototype of an earthquake early warning system that California is pursuing years after places like Mexico and Japan already have them up and running. It detects the very beginnings of earthquakes using seismometers very close to the epicenter and then predicts the shaking that's going to follow so that you can push out a warning to all of those in harm's way. Indeed, while it is thought that globally there are as many as half a million earthquakes every year, only around 100,000 register on the Richter scale, and only about 100 of these cause any visible damage. It was during the first golden age of television, on an evening in May of 1960 in Chile, as this newsreel footage shows that all hell broke loose. Rubble and ruin in the Pacific port of Concepcion in Chile, where she has suffered the worst series of earthquakes in all its history. Details of the damage cannot reveal the extent... The 1960 earthquake in Chile was the largest of the 20th century. The so-called rupture zone was estimated to be around 1,000 kilometers in diameter, from Lebu in central Chile to Puerto Aysen in the extreme south of the country. The severest destruction in Chile occurred in the Valdivia-Puerto Montt coastal region. Practically every building in the port town of Puerto Saavedra was destroyed by waves reaching heights of 11.5 meters, which carried the remains of houses as far as three kilometers inland. Most of the casualties in Chile and beyond were the result of large tsunamis triggered by the initial quake. As touched on, the so-called rupture zone was some 1,000 square kilometers, but the reverberations were literally felt across the Pacific Ocean. There was destruction on Easter Island, in the Samoa Islands, and in California.
In the destruction brought by the 1960 earthquake, not only in Chile, but across the Pacific, the final death toll was 1,655 people. In terms of sheer human cost, the worst earthquake of modern times occurred in Haiti on the January evening of 2010. Death toll estimates begin at about 220,000 people. By the end of the day, at least 52 aftershocks measuring 4.5 or greater had been recorded. An estimated 3 million people were affected by the quake. Haitian government sources estimated that 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings collapsed or were severely damaged. The earthquake caused major damage in Port-au-Prince, Jacmel, and other settlements in the region. Several notable landmark buildings were significantly damaged or completely demolished, including the Presidential Palace, the National Assembly Building, and the Port-au-Prince Cathedral. I think in, uh, in the next few days, people are going to be running out of food, out of water. I think we need help because it's urgent. The mortuaries of Port-au-Prince were overwhelmed with tens of thousands of bodies, which had to be buried in mass graves. As rescue efforts tailed off, vital supplies, medical care, and sanitation were all in short supply. It's a very shallow earthquake, and the, uh, that very shallow depth, coupled with the uh, size of the earthquake, meant that there was a very strong ground shaking. Actually, that fault is pretty similar to the San Andreas fault in the sense that it, uh, it's what we call a strike-slip fault, where one side moves past the other in a horizontal fashion. Any major natural disaster brings tragedy. But in the case of Haiti, it seemed a particularly cruel twist of fate. Before the earthquake of 2010, Haiti was already a pretty desperate sort of place. To give some idea, only a third of the people in Port-au-Prince had regular access to drinking water. The island nation was 145th of 169 countries in the UN Human Development Index, making it the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. So when epic disaster struck, the Haitians were not well prepared, to put it mildly. Delays in aid distribution led to protests from aid workers and survivors. There were instances of looting and outbursts of violence. The US and many other countries eventually responded to appeals for humanitarian aid. I have directed my administration to respond with a swift, coordinated, and aggressive effort to save lives. Practically all of Haiti's somewhat backwards communication systems, air, land, and sea transport facilities, hospitals, and electrical networks had been damaged by the earthquake. The almost non-existent infrastructure and arguably some condescending attitudes on the part of relief agencies seemed to hamper rescue and aid efforts, with logistical problems such as air traffic congestion making matters still worse. Usually we have 150 doctors for the hospital. Now I don't have 20. And yet, even in spite of recent political unrest, the indomitable island nation of Haiti has recovered to a perhaps unexpected degree. Most of the 1.5 million people displaced by the earthquake and living in makeshift tents now live in acceptable housing conditions. Haiti's reconstruction program is in full swing. Throughout Haiti, 
ambitious infrastructure programs are visible, including roads, bridges, and social housing projects. Like beleaguered Haiti, you would think that Kashmir, the setting of a prolonged, sometimes violent border dispute between India and Pakistan, already had enough problems. But a massive earthquake on October 8, 2005, only added to the province's woes. The devastating earthquake shook the Western Himalayas and adjoining regions in the morning. magnitude 7.6 earthquake. It killed something like 80,000 people, injuring tens of thousands, and caused extensive damage in northern Pakistan, leaving millions homeless. I've lost my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, his wife, his little baby child of eight months we've heard, my aunt, my three uncles, his son. A reported 32,335 buildings collapsed in Kashmir and in Pakistan in places as far away from each other as Islamabad, Lahore, and Rawalpindi. Across the border in India, at least 1,300 people were killed and 6,000 injured. The international response was fast, but the remote mountainous terrain that typifies Kashmir just served to compound problems for recovery efforts, with rescue teams struggling to reach the injured. As you can see, it's total devastation, and uh, we're here to do what we can. We've just taken a one live man from the house behind me now and he's off to hospital, so we're gonna pack up our stuff and go and look for somewhere else now. We're struggling because of the remoteness, we're struggling because of logistics, we're now struggling because of the weather and the terrain. You know, as a, as a human being, as a human pro professional, these are absolutely desperate times. You know, we had torrential rain last night. I spoke to the general this morning at 2,000 meters here, which isn't far from here. Uh, temperature was minus three. These people were outside. They were wet. They're now cold. We're going to have people dying. We're going to have people coming down with diseases. Landslides and rockfalls damaged or destroyed mountain roads and highways, cutting off access to the region for several days. Even with today's technology, such as laser beams, which detect plate movement, and a machine called a seismometer, Earthquakes are still difficult to predict. As for being prepared, earthquake-proof buildings and roads, plus training in earthquake drills, all have their merits. Many a life has been saved in this way. But there are limits, especially when you take into account the awesome power of nature. Learning to live each day in the knowledge that desperate hours might just be around the corner is a vital part of what makes life so precious.